Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to more BTS America's three action here. Remaining. After a bit of an intermission, we have finally made our way Five into our second remaining. of three best of threes for you today. It's Pain Gaming now going to be going toe to toe against Team Archon. We just witnessed Pain Gaming battle it past uh, Team, Team Void Boys to get to this spot. They got a little bit of a break, but Archon are fired up and ready to go. I can tell you by firsthand experience based on the lobby chat, they are itching and ready to play. I'm ready to cast. This is Cobble Guy here, and I'm not going to be alone this time. Swinging in on co-caster, I got back once again, Mr. Blaze. Blaze, welcome back, my friend. I don't know if you got to watch a whole lot of the last series, but what do you make about Pain Gaming going against Archon here and now? Should be pretty interesting. I did get to kind of go in and out there. Some of the games ran a little long, but I was actually impressed with how well they were able to Team maintain Archon. and pressure Turn against, uh, particularly in Game 3 there, against that anti-mage. Like, that's a, a game where it's very difficult to... Uh, find the lockdown and find the wherewithal just to, to end the game before it gets too dicey. So I, I got to say that I commend their efforts. They definitely had a, a tough match getting here, but now we're going to be seeing Archon uh, already going into it with Radiant first pick. And I, I think that they're pretty confident, but well, obviously Payne, they, they definitely show that they have at least the, the stake to be here in round two. And this should be actually our first second round match. So it's going to be obviously gradually separating the wheat from the chaff as we go down the road. Mm-hmm. Should be a good one here, and uh, again, now, Pain Gaming, they, they really seem to be loving the gyrocopter here. I mean, we saw a lot of love for the first Dia phase pickup gyrocopters in the, in, like, the previous patch of meta, but Pain Gaming still sticking true with that here. Uh, we saw Void Boys ban it a couple times in the last series with it still left out. Pain will snag it up, but Team it does Archon mean that something tasty back. will be making it through Blaze, and that was the lone druid pickup here from Archon. And they're going to be following it up with a classic American Dota grab here, what looks like possibly the Enchantress. I was going to say the offlane Enchantress, but for a lot of teams that run the offlane lone druid, minutes. I don't know if you have any insight or extra insight for Archon. I, to be honest with you, I haven't watched... I love Five all these guys, but I haven't watched much of their games recently. Do we know if this is going to be a safe lane lone Reserve druid or time. a jungle enchantress by the hands of Fluff or an offlane enchantress? Or maybe they're just using this as a, you know, flexibility and advantage in the draft. Yeah, there's definitely that possibility. We've actually seen a lot of uh, safe lane core lone druid from them. So for the most part, you're going to be seeing J.O. taking it. Okay. into a safe position sometimes they'll like do a little bit of a duo off lane with it and still jay will be playing it but in a, a more vulnerable state Dyer so yeah the lanes aren't really transparent from this it's just uh we, we know generally speaking that they're going to give the farm priority, farm priority to the lone druid mm -hmm. and wherever they they feel that best suits them but it, with the enchantress here i i would say that it's more likely the enchantress goes to the off lane but as you Ten mentioned seconds. if fluff wants it as a support pickup then it's definitely going to be that option for him he's got some Five insane micro skills and uh, i feel like he's very comfortable in these types of heroes so we'll see if uh, he's the one to get it done or if they are going to try to prioritize it and and get those bigger items online because honestly like when you get a even a mid-game enchantress with just a dragon lance and a point booster she's already a really big threat she's already putting out a lot of damage mm -hmm. soaking it up as well it's very hard to bring her down even when you pick against her uh, heroes like witch doctor i was about to point out but witch doctor and gyrocopter are probably the two best damage dealers against enchantress mm -hmm. from the spell based damage of rocket barrage or the death ward you're going to be able to, to clear her out well and witch doctor is also really good because of the cask against the lone druid it's really common to get that bounce back and I feel like that's definitely the pick for pain gaming of course that means that their off lane is still going to be delayed to their fourth pick and um, I'm curious if they do want to go for something like a faceless void I was just going to say that please <laughs> and I was going to say that would be a perfect uh, person to fit Dyer the bill of off lane and the way they dictate the draft you know you don't suspect that it is going to be something that would be uh, you know taken care of or taken away before that with already a commitment from uh, what they could imagine being potentially an off lane entry let's say uh, they don't have to worry about Team Markon grabbing it up. Instead, they do grab the Marana here. So, a nice, interesting grab. Something uh, Fluff has toyed with occasionally in a you know roaming Ten support kind of position. Uh, but what do you make out of that here? I mean, why here and Five now? Do you think remaining. it's not like it's you know sometimes people like Puppy would pick it up to battle back against like a, a Chen or Reserve some way to kind of get an easy kill on those kind of creeps? But is this for you know extra insurance for their mid lane? Because they don't have an OD available, so it's not going to be an OD Marana combo. It's just a intriguing pick to mm -hmm. me. 
Yeah, without the OD, it's going to be a little bit weaker. But in general, I still think this is a, a strat that they want to work on that they probably have been working on and that they want to make fully viable for their team. Uh, Whitebeard plays a really good uh, roaming enchantress. Uh, okay. And so he's going to be able to just collaborate with whoever has any any good lockdown. So, of course, they still, even though they don't have the OD, as you mentioned, they could go for like a Shadow Demon or a Bane for the other support. And if the Faceless Void was to pick up for Pain Gaming here for the offlane, then they have an answer. They do commit for the Faceless Void. I feel like that was pretty much uh, one of the best options they could ask for there. It had been neglected through the whole first part of the banning phase. And for some reason, Archon just felt that the Brood was something that would have been a bit more sketchy and something they don't want to have to deal with. And even the early I understand the Brood ban, but the Queen of Pain is a little bit weird That's to me. True, I think yeah. the Void is a better ban than the Quap, but it depends. If they have so many heroes with so low HP, like the Enchantress Marana and their next two, then that yeah. Sonic Wave damage is something that might be too difficult to even, deal with. Even the Darkseer, it's like, you know, I would Five even seconds. let a Darkseer through Remain. because I feel like they play a, a good Oracle, too, or they know how to play the Oracle, so maybe something they could have mm -hmm. faded time. out from them. But interesting enough, they do decide to leave it out there, so Pain do have a really good bit of synergy with this void already and something I'm sure Archon do anticipate and now we have to see what they want to do to, to counter it here and can't help but still continue to chime in the fact that they have a very flexible kind of a draft and even though they've ran things a certain way they could always change things up a bit so I'm curious to see what kind of other options are there I, I would be more than happy for them to explore new options and casually pick up something like a silencer let's say to be able to counter the initiation of the void cancel a death sure. ward you know, all those kind of things and be able to stop the gyro from being able to spam out a lot, but we'll have to see what kind of cap uh, Fluff has on his head if he wants to be playing more of a mad scientist or just find what's more appropriate in this position. Yeah, I think mid even Mid Silencer could be perfectly viable and it would fit against the, the heroes that they're up against here. But I do think that some of the lanes are pretty transparent. You do not want Enchantress to be supporting alongside Murata. The fact is they're both good at roaming, both good at staying off the lane, both get good at getting involved elsewhere. But if you have them as both of your supports, then you have Dying nobody actually dedicated back. to babysit and to hard zone. So the Enchantress is definitely an off laner as soon as I saw that Murata pick. And that's going to leave their actual five position here to be the Oracle. So now they have an Oracle who, you know, hopefully would be able to keep a safe distance. Ten could be a get out of jail free card for anyone caught inside Team of the Chronosphere Oracle. with the help of False Turn Promise. Uh, as far as his synergy between being able to kind of anti purge, I'm sure there's little things here. Can you, can you fortunes and purge off time dilation? I'm not too sure. Yes, it is completely it is. purgeable. So that's not too bad to have. That's pretty nice. Uh, no heavy spellcasters really on their team with the exception of Oracle. So Oracle going into Five a Faceless Void remaining. can be a bit scary, but like I said, uh, as long as you have the Dia Q available, I guess pick. you can just quickly uh -huh. purge it off. So That's That would it. be a lot of fun to see if they were like really deliberate about it. Four people get uh, by time relations. It's like, uh, gather up. Ever gather. Ever gather. <laughs> <laughs> it could be done. You never know. Oh, final grab here. Going to be pain gaming commitment to the Viper. And the immediate response, without thinking much about it, is going to be the Brewmaster grab. Interesting. Yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting. I think that is going to be a mid-brew here. You'll have your safe lane Lone Druid, and then you can have your off lane Enchantress. Oracle and Marana both are great supports that can kind of set up opportunities here. Even something just a basic Drunken Haze, if not the Thunderclap, could really frustrate the Viper. Arrows will connect. And I do think that also the Lone Druid, Oracle, and Marana do have kill potential against the Void. Mm -hmm. We'll see how well they're able to kind of poke him down. They don't want to go for him when he's 100% HP, but if they can do a little bit of gradual harassment, keep him hovering around like 70%, then there's definite kill potential, which is something you don't often get to say against Void. So it's definitely an asset that Arkan have obtained for themselves, and I think overall they're pretty comfortable with this draft. Yeah, it seems a little bit of remaining. what's kind of in style with a little bit of something fresh here from Fluff, so I'm definitely looking forward to see it kind of blossom here. While on the other side, you have Pain Gaming, who seemed to just have a very nice, well-rounded draft. Prepare it was almost easily kind of just predictable, in a sense, in the way that, the way they were able to throw it together. So we'll see if they're going to uh -huh. be able to achieve some success. So I was trying to read out and gauge as far as I know we have a pretty heavy Brazilian audience with us here today. A lot of the supporters out and showing some love. I, I appreciate that. And of course the team does as well. And I don't know how they feel about the King RD Void. I see some of them praising the hell out of it, Blaze, and other ones, you know, they're like, eh, not like this. This is not going to be good. <laughs> so I'm very anxious to see King RD is, you know, I th doesn't he have like 8k MMR or something like that? Isn't he like a high MMR? I don't think it's that high, but I mean, it he's like a really high there. MMR South American player. I, I don't know sure. how it is, but you know, it's always nice to see him still play. He's been in the circuit for quite a while and should be an exciting matchup. And 
with it being our first second round uh, series Sophie here, winner gets to move to on back. into what I believe is already what the quarters, the semis. I want to take a brief look at the bracket. Yeah, into the semis. So starting to get up into the money. Definitely, but I do think that well, we'll have to answer that question with the faces void. But I think that's going to be really the the crux of whether or not Pain can succeed here is their ultimate usage. If they can get uh, the Chronosphere Death Wards out, if they can get the call downs to follow that up, then those fights are pretty much guaranteed for Pain. But if they the are kind of just bringing low impact Chronos, if they whiff Man. Chronos, then oh it's going to give Archon an opening to push down towers very quickly because they actually have a really good pushing lineup when the bear is leveled up, uh, when the Enchantress has a creep or two with her. It, they definitely can take objectives. So I feel like Payne have to make every Chrono count. And uh, obviously, first, he's got to get to level six. All right. So with the lanes now kind of beginning to develop right here, it looks like they're going to... Yeah, have Mu just do his own thing toward the safe lane setup, and they're going to go a bit more of an aggressive get up for now. And oh man, Tail trying his best to prevent this bear from taking away the creep wave here. Even trying to intercept it a bit with the creep camp here. Gets a couple of them, but they've already oh, made their move. Yeah. Nice catch, fortunes, and arrow combo. And that's all it takes. First blood already on the gyro. The supports up in arms with this frisky bear. So gyro was left on his own and caught out of position. Absolutely, and this is going to actually be quite effective here because the, like I said, the Fortune's End is, it's not a, as good as a disruption for setup, but it's just short of it. It definitely is going to create a lot of value uh, that Pain have trouble playing around, as, especially before the Gyrocopter gets boots, and they can just keep doing this. They can I do this over and over. At least they're getting good damage out. Pretty damn good setup. I mean, once he charges it up now, it is going to be a swing and a miss there. That was a, a from downtown. Yeah. So. I think that might have been another kill, honestly, if they had yeah. uh, connected with the arrow. He was getting very low very quickly. It's a great setup. I mean, even in your pubs, you don't even have to vocalize too much. Once you see the charge up happening, you just pretty much have to just be ready with the arrow to shoot the second you see the projectile in air. And uh, you can time it out not too bad. But, of course, it's now is more as the positioning here. The gyro, maybe you need to start hugging the creeps a bit or something so that you have at least some sort of barricade. And there's mm, another arrow, go. this one from behind, and it gets a big it's hit onto the Witch Doctor now. This is definitely like a, something funky here coming out from Archon. I, <laughs> I don't know if you grind it out in like a pub here and there, but it definitely seems like a very unique and aggressive kind of tri lane. Definitely, it shows its potential here. They actually have not run the Marana Oracle before in competitive games, so they've they've run it with the Bane, uh, with uh, plenty of other disabling heroes, but they have not run it particularly with Oracle. We're gonna have a Haste Advenge coming bottom, but Enchantress, even with level two untouchable, is already just that untouchable. Uh, they'll try to mess with her as best they can, but honestly, this this hero is just too strong right now. Yep. Mu is not going to be put off the least here and get right on back into the ground the level. But back at top, looking to make it go. It looks like they got the setup onto 40R. He's trying to muscle away, but it's not going to be enough. Archon just showing maybe a little bit of, you know, what they're going to get ready for Shanghai, Blaze. You know, maybe just trying to try out some new things a bit, see how it works out when they have this, you know, BTS run. And so far, it is definitely guaranteed him a strong start in the top lane. Bottom lane, Enchantress gets to do as she pleases here. But what about this mid lane matchup? Monkey's 11 and 6 to the 11 5 of a, of a Viper. So he's actually mm. matching up even in a matchup where you typically think the Brewmaster would be at a huge disadvantage. But look at this an arrow setup now for the Viper. They go on to him after taking down the Venge. They're looking at a 3 on 1 for this. He eats oh, the Fairy God. Fire, but they're going to get him in the end. It's a killing spree already for Fluff. Archon showing that they were not happy to wait for this game at all, Blaze. They are rip-roaring and ready to play. That is awesome. This is just a really great strat that they're executing extremely well. They've played it, uh, played the Marana five times in the past two weeks, so they definitely are trying to get this strat ready uh, for a competitive setting, and it's something that they're not going to surprise opponents by, but it's also something that it, it's essentially going to force teams to draft differently around them. It, you can't just open up with a certain uh, support pairing. Like we saw the Venge and the Witch Doctor in the first three picks, and that allows you to make these roaming plays happen because you don't get to manipulate uh, things as easily. Like you don't get to stop arrows with an Abaddon shield or anything else. You don't get to uh, break it with summons, stuff like that. Oh, no. So it's it's actually really strong. And you can also see why the Root Mother was a high priority band in phase two is because spider links are gonna always prevent a arrow play on a an offlaner. So if for some reason the Marana, the Oracle wanted to gank bottom, it would be absolutely impossible. Now just 
the world can almost be like their oyster as they continue to be a bit of a tirade. Anytime they're off the map, I'm sure that Pain are going to be on edge a bit. And they're already looking to set up their next maneuver here towards the mid lane, smoked up, ready to play. And you can see the hesitation by Viper. This is a brew who just gets to do as he pleases, and the Viper is just not really sure where trouble could be popping up from, so he's forced back under the tower. And now they're going to take their movement towards the top lane, it would appear. And uh-oh, Witch Doctor from the high ground now. Quickly sees Troubles nearby. Fluff going to dish it out, and the arrow should come. Whitebeard leaping into place. Gets the setup, but it's going to force out the lane rotation from Pain, and they'll be able to assist him. These two are just really causing a ruckus here for Pain. And the great thing is, with aggro trilings, you always, always want to look at the solo lanes and make sure that they can handle themselves too, because an aggro tri is very constantly dedicated to the top lane. Obviously, we made a, saw one rotation towards mid, and we might see a second, but generally speaking, you want to make sure your mid laners can hold their own, and so far, they're thriving. The Enchantress is top of the last hit, Brewmaster just behind. Fortune's end, there's the arrow, and here comes Monkeys with the KS. He just go ahead and stomp it on down, pick up the extra kill, a freebie, and... Archon take their advantage now to 5-0. and oh. and, You know, it's like a, a, a unique variation on the old, you know, Marana bane roaming duo a bit, but Oracle provides hefty bursts. Bane had bursts too, but his cost is, what, 160-some-odd mana. Oracle's cost 65, 60 mana, whatever. It's ridiculous. And now they're going to continue to go to work. Now, no arrows set up this time. There's some creep blocking in, but he'll still get the catch. Uh, four. four. Four to the top lane. King RD says it's time to debut the Chrono. I don't care if it's on a little Oracle. We got to get something for ourselves. And they finally get themselves on the board. One to five. Hell, I mean, that or one Oracle kill is a killing spree. It's a 282 oh, gold. So, true. I mean, something. It's definitely worth the rotation at the very least. Get the, the four man movement there. Try to make some forward momentum happen. Uh, we might actually see the first blind arrow of the game, just it, well unassisted at the least. But now Rayer is actually move, making his move up, so Whitebeard will just sneak in behind. But yeah, overall the Void cannot hold against the Enchantress, especially not after she's at level six. So Moose's been winning attack. his He's safe lane attack. handily. It's actually. Yeah, Closing in on triple the, the last hit value for Mu, and he's going to start Dyer's pressuring the tower. Void just doesn't have the ability to deal with Dyer's an Enchantress directly, and the Gyrocopter has been the, the punching bag so far in terms of kills. Yeah, and it, that's the thing is like, we're, I'm sitting here getting so tickled and following around this, this setup between, you know, maybe Monkeys Forever and then of course Ooh. Fluff and Whitebeard, but. Yeah, arrow is gonna be a bit of a miss on the Dyer's mid lane, but I totally attack. just forgot that there's an enchantress in the game. That's just a mid game insurance policy, and oh yeah, there's also a lone druid who's doing as he plays up here in the top lane. The three big cores of Archon take the three best in the net worth right now, and nearly the best in CS. Gyro is able to hold his own at 40, but he is continuously under pressure here from the rest of Archon and. What's, what's the comeback play here for, for Pain? They did a nice job getting that early rotation. They got the Chrono to the top lane. They took the, the bounty on top of the Oracle here, but is it continuing to work around the cooldown of the Chrono? Is that their best bet? That's definitely one of the three things that they're going to have to be doing. The, the second thing they just did recently with the Gyrocopter in the Eastern Jungle, farming stacks is a great way to get your supports up to higher levels. When you have level 6 on your Venge and your Witch Doctor, you have a lot better way to respond to tough spots. If somebody gets arrowed and you could swap them into a safer position and then counter-engage, that's really important. So that's going to be really important for the Venge to get 6. And of course, we know how valuable a Death Ward is when it comes online and hopefully to sync up with the next Chronosphere. So... Getting support levels is actually really important in this game. And then beyond that, yeah, so the stacking is a key way to get make that happen. And the, the final thing is a pretty simple one, but it's when Archon go for the aggressive plays, be there to react, be there to counteract dives. And unfortunately, up against a Brewmaster, that's not always that easy because the Brewlings don't mind taking shots from the tower. Mm -hmm. But it's just, if you can, try to respond, try to punish a dive. It, it's going to be a... A tall order, though, for Pain. You're, you're looking to go into now a pretty oh, heavy set Archon squad. Great. When you get the jump on a team, like, oh, you got the Chrono set up to hopefully burst down the Brew. Well, you better hope Oracle's not nearby and not level 6 because he has the potential to easily help. Nice little green thumb action here from Monkeys <laughs> in the fin lane, planting down a tree yet to eat it. Doesn't even have the Tango to do so. He's just giving one back to nature, it looks like. But, you know, it's a hard team to be able to break right now. Now, oh, that sucks. The, the smoke yeah. breaks bottom. Yep. They they were trying to. I mean, that should have been an opportunity. Magic missile, call down, and the rock barrage. Enchantress is, is not going to be able to survive against Radiant's that very effectively, no matter how much movement speed attack. she starts with. But they, the troll scouts it out. The smoke breaks, and 
Now uh, they might not even get the bottom tier one. I think the Archon could make a move with their Brewmaster there. Oh, no TP on the Brew, never mind. Yeah, no TP also on the lone Radiant's Brew in the meantime. Fluff and them, they're just gonna work on their own tier Dyer's one, it looks like, at the top lane. So Pain will get the first tower, it looks like, of the game. Radiant's so something going their way is a little bit of an extra little boost for everyone. Here comes Monkeys, pops his drums. He's making a move for Viper here. He doesn't care about this tanky son of a gun. He pulls out the split. Nice. Oh, nice arrow setup. Comes in from the man with the white beard. And that's going to lead to their kill. And a killing spree all of a sudden here for Monkeys Forever on the Brew. Regeneration. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I'm I, sure the arrow connected, but it didn't actually show the Sacred Arrow stun debuff on the Vipers. That was a little, I don't know, maybe a recent patch thing messed that up, but... No matter the case, uh, the cool thing that they we can add to that is that later on we're going to be able to see Cyclone arrows if they're well timed. There have been a couple teams that have tried to do it and they don't sync up very well. Oh, they actually chrono them. Now is this going to be one arrow or just the the heals from Fluff to try to help them out? Is it enough? Fate's Edict is going to absorb all that magical damage, but there's no purifying flames coming out. It looks like Fluff just knows he might be out of position. They've already sacked monkeys as it is, and they'll just tell him to get back in a way. So. It is going to cost something a bit of Archon right there. That's another bounty going their way. So a good movement from Pain to be able to catch him from behind when he didn't have the split. And they're going to be walking away with what looks like 473 extra gold. And it goes towards Mr. King RD on the Faceless Void. So getting that much closer towards the Vlads. I don't know. It could be Vlads. I saw Mask of Madness in the Radiant's last series. That was something crazy. But attack. it looks like a Vlads with the, with the headdress already being in order. Yeah, sometimes Voids just realize that there's not going to be enough damage on the field without their their own contribution with the, the fast attack speed, so they go with that option. Uh, either tool is mostly just to sustain the Void so he can get to the next big thing, but in this case, uh, yeah, the Vlad seems to be the most appropriate just to, to try to deal with all the damage, at least part of all the damage coming out. There's still a lot of gear and magical, but uh, you have to start with something. So In the meantime, though, you get to see the Marana support getting just as much net worth, I'll just shy of it. And she's gonna be building up the Guardian Greets. This is very common for Whitebeard to pick it up with the Marana. And just being able to leap in and use those to keep people alive af before or after Chrono just really can reshape how the game plays out. Back at bottom lane here, maybe we'll see a little bit of a push coming out from Archon to be able to creep forward. This tier one very, very low. Ping already from King RD, but he has no Chrono, still needs 30 seconds here, so. Pain might have to hand this one over, but he's still happy to show himself. A little sidestep to Shockwave as a Fortune's End will kind of tickle him a bit, but they will be able to get the finish on this Tier 1 and walk away Dyer's with a little bit of extra purse. And here comes Pain now rotating in. He has a Gyrocopter. Gyro not going any sort of Helm of the Dominator. Fighting kind of a build here, please. He's gotten the early Ogre Club. Is it straight to the BKB for him here? I feel like that might be a mistake. Sanj is okay. Like... I don't know. The VKB is good against the Drunken Haze, but that's about the most that you're worried about. Everything else is, is either going to be negligible enough, just not good enough reason to pick up the VKB. So, yeah, I would have to say that he might just go into, like, a Sanj build or and then into SMY. If he goes for the BKB this early just for the Drunken Haze, then they're going to have really big problems. Oh, Fluff steps in to get a pick, but oh. there's a call down response from Pain. Set up also with the Chronosphere here. They're looking to get a catch on the move, but that untouchable makes him too hard. And now the impetus strikes come out. King RD is able to take away a lot of the damage with the time walk, but Gyro can't do the same. He goes down. Moo's going to get the last hit on that one. And now Viper out of position. The cask flies through them quite a bit. Moo eats the most of it now. It could be going down. Will go down. Now Viper under pressure from both J.O. and Monkeys Forever. This is a full staff fight happening here. And Pain Gaming, after already losing two, it looks like they might be able to get... Nope, Savage Roar. Ah, oh, they will be able to get it. 300 gold back their way. A deep committed fight from Archon going between the two towers for it. But they are able to take the Gyro down and corner the fight recap. A near wash at the end of the day. Yeah, they make a, a good dive and they get some really good damage up from the Enchantress, but she dies way too deep and she does get punished for it pretty heavily. Still, the tier 1 tower is the key objective here and that's going to be Archons to take. And uh, Pretty soon they're going to just be taking towers left and right. They will probably wait for the split before they get too aggressive in a 5-man sense, but uh, things like Roche, things like towers, like I mentioned earlier, are going to be very quick pickings for them. With this opportunity, Fluff, I'm um, getting in some nice deep vision already. Now, it looks like they're able to kind of read the movement that's happening here as King RD will continue to push down this top lane still trying to finish that utility factor and grabbing up the Vlads for his team 
Jail on the other side. His minus has been done, but now he has the phase on the bear, and he puts it right to work. And I love it. It was something I saw. I was watching. I hope I don't say his name incorrectly. Is King RD still in a bit of trouble right now? Actually, he gets hit with a Fortune's Hand and a Purifying Flames, but quickly time walks away, and we'll be able to make it away to safety. But I was watching. Kezu, Kezu, he's the new up-and-comer Dota player, attack. transferred from Han. He was playing Lone Druid last night, Blaze, and talking a lot of, of about the hero and providing some great insight and tips, but he, he was showing some immaculate play, being able to swap around the phase boots easily between himself and the bear and putting him right into a fight mode and talking about stacking the root and then the Savage Roar on top is just all that extra lockdown and, and disable potential, and we saw a bit of it there with Jo. Yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of, of ways you can manipulate that to get the most out of the hero, absolutely. And he's obviously has a lot to play around with right now in terms of just overall income. Went for the Iron Talon early, and then the Midas, and now he's still got like 2,000 gold. Could still go for the Radiance if you wanted to. It, it sounds greedy, but the continuous lane pressure is still something that you can create a lot of value out of. And uh, I was watching this race very closely, wasn't sure. It was pretty much neck and neck. We're going to see the Marana actually pick up the mechanism before the Viper, and that just sucks so much for Rear. Like, the, the Vipers had a terrible game, the Marana's had a great one, and this support has actually gotten the key item first. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I don't know the guy and how he plays yet, but it almost seems like he, he's like a, a miracle junior in the sense where we've got to see so much amazing flashy play from him in the last game as this Invoker. But now he's in the hands of a Viper, and you can't help but feel like, is he able to do as much as he'd like here? Already being bullied and quite a bit in the early laning phase. The roaming Marana set up onto him and the Brewmaster being able to kind of have his number and now he's just kind of stuck plateaued a bit. And as you were mentioning, his mech, the timing isn't at a great peaking window where it's going to be a, a bit of trouble for Archon. They already have a mech of their own to kind of battle back with and we'll have to see what he's going to try to find as far as comeback potential. And I'm curious if, if this ends up continuing to be a slippery slope for Pain, if they'll change up how they want to draft for him in the in the second game. We'll have to see. I like the smoke coming up from Pain, the fact that they don't have the Darkopter in it. Gyrocopter's gonna push forward and that gives Pain to take uh, one of two fights. It's actually gonna be up top with the use of Carnage Spirit, the Malediction, uh, hits on two as well, but Jayo gets the Moonlight Shadow away and that looks to be enough for him. Maybe not the bear. Monkey's Forever wanting to turn it. Does go up for the split on Witch Doctor. Well, meanwhile, the rotation that I was talking about doesn't mean anything. Mid lane, arrow. Catch onto the gyro, follow fortunes end. It might be enough lockdown for the rotation here. 40R gets off the call down, tries to go for a retreat. Moon not going to be able to make it in time, it looks like, to be able to get the slow off yet. And now the heal comes out from the flames, and he's going to be able to make it away to safety. In the meantime, Monkeys Forever does get the catch, taking down the Witch Doctor, it looks like, and then quickly putting himself into uh, a... They see him. They see him oh, with the ward. Oh, that's trapped. so sad. He's trapped. Well, he's there. He doesn't want to swap him out, obviously. Viper comes around the front. Yeah, just leave him. Just hit him. He's just going to hit him. It's like a zoo animal stuck behind a cage. Sorry, monkeys. It's pinged that also. Unfortunate. Fluff lets him know, and they're looking for a counter fight. Oh, nice swap save. Puts Viper on the high ground, but this means Vengeful Spirit's in trouble. Whitebeard goes right up there looking for a chase, and he's making a move. He needs four more seconds for a new arrow. 40 mm, R's up and ahead, but does not want to turn back in. But mm, look at that chunky damage. <laughs> Boom! Bobble with the arrow, and Fluff will KS it with the flames. And that's going to be it. 11 to 5. Archon way up and beyond now. A forgiving little catch right there as they get Monkeys Forever, who gets himself caught in a bit of a sticky situation. But Archon again are able to just battle back and take that much more. And it just shows how difficult it is going to be for them to bring down the bear in a fair fight because he lasted so long just in that skirmish. They are really lacking damage on the side of pain. They they have control. Like the cask is great against the brewmaster and against the lone druid. The obviously the cornosphere is their primary way of setting things up. When it comes down to it, they just need damage now. They have their way to survive to extend the fight. But what do they do during that extension? How do they actually bring heroes down quickly? And I, I just don't see it. Right now we've got the Oracle coming online with his ultimate and with his multiple means to save people's mm -hmm. lives in conjunction with the mech and then, of course, the nature's attendance as well. All these factors make it almost impossible for Pain to find even the first kill in the fight, let alone take the fight as a whole. I mean, somehow they can get some forgiving fights from Archon and Witch Doctor is able to finish off this Agnums. They could do some serious mm -hmm, yeah. work with a Chrono, but that seems like a bit of a far stretch right now. 
But who really knows? Uh, I've seen some crazier comebacks in just the last series, and already King RD does get the catch on the white beard. Time dilation, call down, double ults committed for the roaming Marana, and they're not gonna get him. False promise comes in from Fluff. A nice save. Arrow is gonna be a swing and a miss, and the Witch Doctor cast might force him back it away. Witch Doctor does make it out in the back end of a TP. Can King RD do the same? Oh, Savage that's Roar weird. comes out, and it's gonna be denied. They will be able to take down the Faceless Void. All hands on deck for this one, but it is going to be a grab nonetheless. Archon pick up that one, and there's a missed opportunity for pain. Just Archon rotating in and being there at the right time. Mm -hmm. Really good ulti, of course, from Fluff, and then suddenly you're right back up to full HP that, with all those double heal mechanics. But yeah, I feel like the Witch Doctor Death Ward is all you can count on at this point. It wasn't really effective enough in the last fight, and that Aghanims is pretty much going to be the, the make or break point. If he can get to the Aghanims and he can use it extremely well, the Death Ward doesn't get interrupted in a fight, I think Pain will take that fight, but that's, that's a lot of ifs. Looks like next in order for Whitebeard is a four staff, so the maneuverability, the force plays to be able to get away, help maybe even be able to dodge a quick chrono, who knows, but split away from a cask. Just more tools in the tool belt here of Archon that are that much heftier than the side of Pain. And under attack. You can see Archon now even kind of asserting themselves across the map. They've already got some nice deep wards here. Uh, actually, this ward up here is about to be expired, so... Archon and Pain probably. are actually terrified of Archon's warding situation right now. Look at all the sentry wards yeah. they just placed out. Like, they had just cleared out this ward here, and they're like, oh, but they still might have one over top. here. And it's like, you, when they that? are... Five? Five terrified. wards down? One, two, three, four? Something like that. Yeah, the fifth one there, too. Yeah. So, Dyer's they honestly, like, top. even Sounds after top. getting a D ward off, they're still placing sentries. They're still terrified of being detected in their move, but we're actually gonna see smoke on smoke, and this will give Pain an advantage. Oh, from the high ground, King RD gets a pretty good chrono here, but there's gonna be the quick jump out. Fluff now under huge pressure. The mech's gonna keep him alive. Can he get the false promise off? He certainly can, and he quickly goes to work. Fate's Edict falls up with the flames, and he might be able to survive. King RD not gonna let him go, though, but on the other side, they're gonna make their jump. Fluff does end up going down, but they get the return fire, taking down the Vengeful Spirit. Now the Brewmaster Brutally is looking to go to work to take down the Witch Doctor here. A follow-up kill as they grab Mu. Gyrocopter goes to work there. But both supports are going to be going down from the side of Pain. And here comes the core power coming out from Archon. Suddenly, Jo shows up, and he is a mighty, mighty beast. Easily gobbles up the Viper. And that is going to be Archon in now a, a more highly touted position. And it looks like they're going to just use this to step back and continue farming. But a good fight does swing their way. And a small net worth swing. Very small. Yeah, but it's like that's the best opportunity they can get is a smoke on smoke. The lone druid's not ready for a big fight. All they wanted was a little skirmish play, and they got a full on engagement where the chronosphere started at all. So honestly, that's what Pain are looking for. Those are the fights they want, and their their advantage wasn't that considerable. So yeah. we're gonna continue to look for Archon's next move. It looks like Roche should be pretty convenient with the chronosphere on cooldown for another thirty five seconds. He's gonna be spotted out by Venge, but. Really, what can Pain do about it at this point? They do have a Death Ward up. They will not have a Chrono. So their best opportunity is probably to not take the fight at all. Moonlight Shadow does come out from Whitebeard here. Maybe just trying to see if he can get himself in a spot. Drops Radiant's an OBS. Actually under spots out, almost hits 4DR with an arrow towards the mid lane. Radiant just kind of, you know, hey, we're not at Roche. We're not doing other things. And we're also going to try to stop your push a little bit here. And, uh, okay, Fortune's end, but quickly going to be sidestepped there from King RD. And on the back end of the whole thing, they are going to be taking the Roche down, and the Aegis will be going into uh, look like Jo's pocket. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so Radiant's push <laughs> for the tier two. Nothing really to stop them there. And the question is really if the high ground is going to be enough. They know that Witch Doctor still doesn't have his axe, has not Dyer's been farming rapidly enough to make a difference. So, yeah, they're Dyer's just going to go right hardcore right up front, and I don't know. All the sentries in the world won't protect you once they're they're just barreling down the front door and Radiant's they've got everything they need. Uh, the Marana is going to be getting in position very quickly for the arrow and one arrow will will mean pretty much a 5v4 on the high ground. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. So now in positioning here, very well spread is Archon as they easily Dyer's slow siege with the help of the bear. Swap back but Savage War is going to allow him to get the easy finish and we have to see what's Pain going to do to stop it here. 
They have their ultis up and ready. It looks like they do. They better help for one hell of a play. And oh, a start by getting stunned up. Are they going to take advantage of this? It looks like they want to. Monkeys moves in, gets the stomp. He's going to commit the split. He certainly will. And Payne are going to be forced to disengage. BKB is going to pop defensively to kind of step back. Now they're looking to make a move. Bear eats a lot of the damage. Roar going to be going out, but they are going to be taking him down. And uh, it looks like he is not going to have a resummon. Oh, no, he just summoned it up. Okay, so he's yeah, got a new one, but will not have a follow-up here. Then they look like they don't want to leave unless they get both racks. Yeah, it's it's tempting to stick around, but losing the bear like that without getting anything more than just the BKB. Like, if they use the BKB and the Chrono and they get the bear, then... I think you still commit for the melee racks, but because the Chronosphere is still left in the tank, uh, JO's A just means nothing. Like, obviously, they'll just focus the Spear Bear rather than the Lone Druid. And from there, it's it's Archon that would be giving way too much away. So, as tempting as it is to stay and finish off the second half of the melee racks, it's much better that they back off and wait just mm -hmm. uh, about 80 seconds before they go in again. Going again while they still have the Aegis, I assume. So. Yeah, with uh, everything they, they have, presumably. And for Pain, they're going to push back as much as they can. So it's Archon are going to be stalled out away from using their Aegis, or yes. they're going to be looking Radiance for a catch, it looks like. Attack. There's the Moonlight Shadow. King RD Radiance not looking to commit the Chrono fallen. here. They will get the finish on the Tier 1 in the mid lane, but they're still moving in like they want to take a fight. And Archon are not going to be looking to take a fight yet. They're going to split the bottom and top lane and wait till it's absolutely necessary to come back. But they should be the better team as 5 with the Aegis here. But Kane are looking to maybe just force Ar Archon to rotating and then pulling off with their own plan. And it looks like they'll just pull off earlier. They see that the pushes are coming at top and bottom and they don't want to kind of play this game. Alright, so we're going to see, just kind of split the map up for Pain, try to get their lanes pushed out. But uh, if they get a pick off or two, then... Obviously, Archon are, are going to be that much more incentivized to, to make their next move. Now, the Aegis timing here still favors Archon. They've got almost two minutes to go straight for that melee racks again in mid, and they've got their cooldowns back up. They've got the resummon on the bear. They've got the primal split. Uh, so I think that Archon are still... Their next play is still going to be going down mid. Yep, and now they have an Aether lens even on Fluff and his Oracle, so being able to get off the, the safety of a False Promise or any sort of heal or Fate's Edict, let's say, makes it that much easier so he, he can kind of put himself into a, a good safety zone and be able to assist or allow maybe a core to be that much more you know assertive let's say so now as they kind of roll in two bears ready Aegis still left on pain gaming they just got the AC on the, on the spear bear as well oh so this is going to make these towers look wow. even more out of paper right now okay they're going to get off the early viper strike on for jail but this bear continues to chunk away at this melee rex pain got to be doing something here with their team fight what can they do to hold they have now just lost their mid lane rex are they going to be able to do anything about it are they going to make chase can they stop archon from making it away no they just don't have enough right now they already oh low the bear on dies to a satyr blast oh, oh that's so serious sad. <laughs> yeah the homing missile is coming. They were ready to clear that one out, and then suddenly, out of the forest comes the Seder Tormentor, who now Mu uh, will possess and punish, I presume. But we're going to see them not even hesitate to go up top here with seconds, the bear maybe, on cooldown. Left on the ages, so it doesn't matter though because he he has only one bear. So yeah. like know. if the bear dies, it might as well be the druid dying. But oh, hard jump in from monkeys, and an arrow is going to connect that viper. Stun and lock down. 40 yard going to be forced to pop his BKB and go to work while back. King RD jumps off the chrono. J.O. going to be muscled out now. But they got the time dilation. But the heals begin to come in from Fluff. He already commits his false promise. J.O. gets the kill. Quickly takes down Gyro. going to be forced to buy back. Viper goes down. He might need to buy back too. He commits his buyback. This is the second life. Perhaps the final hurrah here for 4DR. And whew, he barely makes it out alive. Monkeys, though, the man left inside, very deep here. It looks like it'll be a slow, painful death for him. Archon decide to go into a bit of a brawl with pain and will walk away, being able to take two of their buybacks on the way out. So that's definitely what Archon were looking for, just force all those buybacks. Now we're going to see not only have they had this advantage for the past 27 minutes, but the next seven minutes are going to be guaranteed to go their way. But just the, the two cores, Viper and Gyro, don't have the money to get their next item. They won't have the buyback for the next big engagement, which I presume will be around Roshan. And from there, it should be a kind of a walk-in from Archon, unless Payne do something very 
surprising. I mean, the their smokes, as far as I can tell, are completely out. No, there's one on the courier, and that's their last one, which they'll probably say for Roshan. Uh, from there, the the witch doctor, very close to Agadim's, but a thousand gold is probably too much more for him to farm at this stage in the game. What do you think about Void going for? I don't. Did he get the blink dagger before or after the point booster here? Just based on the situation he's been put in, as he's harassing a bit with Whitebeard here, the blink does you know, reads like as if maybe they want to make some sort of crazy catch play outside the base because otherwise, wouldn't you want to invest that money to make sure you have a chrono at the ready for every hold instead of you swing one out, you miss your chance defending, and then you don't have any sort of you know new one for round two. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely have that logic where in a defender's position, you want to have that back off cooldown sooner, but I feel like getting a better chrono is much better than having one that's shorter cooldown. I would compare it to, like, a Magnus getting a Blink Dagger. Like, yes, he can go ahead and just skewer into the fight for an RP, but you'd much rather have the quick Blink, the instant guaranteed initiation. So I think that Blink is still an absolute must-have on Void, and... Uh, it just, uh, like you said, it depends on the timing. There might be some situations where Aghanim, it's completing Aghanims is better, but uh, it's difficult to call. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a justification to that. The, the one chrono might be all it needs to kind of be the stepping stone towards a, a bit of a comeback game here, but it's still a, a, a long road to take. But actually, look at this. Is this a complexity-style smoke Dizzy. wraparound gank? Oh, Whitebeard pops out the Moonlight out. Shadow, and the He's smoke is now popped, and now they are just... Lost in a bit of a disarray. Void heads top. The rest of his team struggling around on the bottom. Get back inside. Oh no! The impetus oh, no! is coming out, and King RD goes down. No faceless Void going to be at the ready for a full minute. It's absolute disaster for Pain. They were hopeful and trying to make a huge flank play happen, but it is just absolutely discombobulated, and they are done. Oh, what a hot mess at the end. It's okay, Dakota. He got the time dilation on the Spirit Bear. He, he's feeling good. <laughs> no, oh my gosh. That was that was a very unfortunate death to the face of Void, but it has been Archon that have been able to control the map. They dominated the lanes. They roamed across the map with a just resounding victory from these supports. You know, if you could just compare what the Oracle and Marana were able to do in the first 10 minutes of the game compared to the Vengeful Spirit and the Witch Doctor, there's almost no comparison. Like There is just so much favoring Archon from the first 10 minutes. And of course, the, the laning matchup. Like, yeah, they face the Void got a little bit more farm than he would if he was in an awfully in 1v3, but not that much more because the Enchantress is just so good in that matchup, as she's good in a lot of uh, one versus one matchups. So I would actually have to say that Archon overall, they, they had a massive advantage in the drafting stage. They mm -hmm. knew what they were giving them. They're like, okay, well, if you we give you Witch Doctor, you'll take it. If we give you Void, you'll probably take it too. But the thing is, Team Archon had an answer for everything. Their laning configuration uh, was just better than Pain, and they were able to just continue to snowball that advantage without giving up too much. So with that, and I, I couldn't have said it any better myself, to be honest with you, so we'll just go ahead and cut to a break. When we return, it's going to be game number two, Archon versus Pain Gaming in round number two of BTS America's 3. I'm Coddle Guy. That's Blaze. We'll see you soon for game two action.